Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the program. A word from the Lord. James Oldfield here with you. Glad you're with us, and we hope that you will stay tuned for another study from God's Word. The, I thought it was very interesting that the content that Caleb was going over is going to dovetail pretty nicely, I think, with what we're going to discuss tonight. So I hope that you will stay tuned for that. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. 276-340-2653 is my phone number, and I would love to hear from you. And if you're in the area and you want to study the Bible, if you're in the Eden area, 250 the Boulevard is where we meet. Sundays at 9 a.m., 10 a.m. for worship. Thursdays at 7 p.m. And, of course, if you're in the Martinsville area or the Danville area, 823 Starling Avenue and 120 American Legion in Danville is where you can assemble with uh, God's people in those areas and study God's Word with them. And, of course, I want to remind you that uh, we have a Word from the Lord radio program. It's a live call-in program on Sunday afternoons at 5 p.m. For those of you in uh, the Rockingham County area, surrounding areas, it's, uh, four, it's 1490 a.m. Or you can listen online at uh, Rockingham County Radio, rcr24.com. Uh, download the app onto your smartphone or your device or on YouTube. So a number of ways where you can study God's Word with us, and we hope that you will take advantage of that very thing. Now, as I said, uh, tonight we're going to be discussing, really, how to use the enemy's weapon against them. I, I don't know if you're impressed with this sort of thing, but I'm impressed with individuals that can uh, take weapons, disarm an attacker, and then turn that weapon back on them. It takes a lot of skill, it takes practice, it takes discipline to know how to do that or to train to do that, but eventually if you know how to use it, you know the tactics, you can take a weapon away and use it on the attacker. And you can just... Google disarming attacker on YouTube, and there's some pretty interesting uh, uh, videos that you can see of this very tactic. But friends, that's exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about studying the Bible and using the Bible and even using the enemy's weapons against themselves. Now, there were some individuals in the Bible that literally did this. For example, I want you to listen to uh, um, about a man named Benaniah. Benaniah uh, was one of David's uh, mighty men. And uh, when I was in school, I think Brother Curry used to call him Benaniah the Butcher. Uh, anytime anybody needed to be killed, send Benaniah. And this is why. Benaniah was a mean, mean man. I mean, he's a bad man. He, he just, uh, he was tough. Notice what the Bible says about it. Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, of, uh, the son of a valiant man, uh, Kebzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab, and he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. Now, I don't know about you, I don't want to attack a lion anytime, much less uh, on a snowy day in, in a pit, you know, close quarters. But Benaniah was that kind of man. But notice this. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high, and in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam, and he went down with went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. Now that's pretty that's pretty bad. That's pretty tough. And so I'm saying this is the kind of man that you're dealing with. He he knew how to use his enemy's weapon against him. Now you can see why David would have liked Benaniah, why he was uh, impressed with Benaniah, you might say, because this was something like David did. Notice in 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 50, we all know the story of David <coughs> and Goliath. David killed Goliath with a, with a sling and a stone. But the Bible says David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines, uh, when the Philistines saw the champion was dead, they fled. Now, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about using the enemy's weapon against them because it will always make the enemy flee. It will dishearten them. It will discourage them when you use their own weapon against them. Now, in a, in a spiritual sense, that's exactly what uh, men like Paul did. 
You know, friends, it is, it is very easy, if you just do a little research, a little study, to take the enemy's weapons and just turn it on them. Just turn it on them. For example, notice what Paul does. Paul uses this as a, as a powerful tool to uh, discombobulate, I mean, cause chaos among the, uh, um, among the enemies, if you will, or to make a point so that individuals who are listening will see the truth or see the error of what they're believing, maybe. See the truth compared to the error that they're believing. For example, in Acts 17, in verse 22, Acts chapter 17, in verse 22. Now here's Paul, he's in Athens, and they take him up to the Areopagus, and here he is in the midst of Mars Hill, and he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar to, with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now, he's going to make a point. He's going to prove who the true and living God is. He's going to help them see that these idols, these gods that they're worshiping, they're not real, but there is one God that they don't know, and he is the one that Paul is going to uh, show them. Notice what he says. He says, The God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth, and hath determined the time before appointed and the bounds of their habitation and that, that they should seek, af, sh, seek after the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now, here's his point. For in him we live, move, and have our very being. Now, his point is, you're close. You mean, he's not far from you. You can find this unknown God, the God that you're worshiping ignorantly, that you don't know anything about. But you can find him. He's not far from us. He created the heavens and the earth. He created all men out of one blood. And it's in him we live, move, and have our very, very beings. And then notice what he does. He quotes, As certain also of your own poets have said, For we are also his offspring. So he says, Your, your own poets are saying that we're the offspring of God. And therefore he says, For as much then, as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, to silver, or stone, graven by art or man's device. See what he's doing? He says, even your own poets recognize that there is a God that created us, that we are his own offspring, and seeing is that we are his own offspring, we're not rock and stone, we're not silver, we're not graven images. We are more like the God that is our creator, the God that is our, our, our father, the one that we are the offspring of. We are more like him than we are these rocks and stones out here that you're worshiping. So he's making a point by using their own poets, their own authorities, if you will. And friends, that is the power of the truth. When you have individuals out here espousing error and they're making up man-made doctrines, it's easy to turn those tools, those weapons against them if we just take a little doing, take a little exercise, take a little practice. And so that is what Paul did now. Paul's not the only one. Jesus did the same thing. Look at what Jesus did. In John chapter 10, John chapter 10, and about verse, uh, well, let's back up a few verses here. Uh, verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you for my Father. For which of these works do ye stone me? They're going to st they want to stone him. And the Jews answered, say, answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said ye are gods. Now what does Jesus do? He quotes, he quotes Psalm 82, and verse 6. Now here's what, now they would all, they're all going to listen to the psalmist. They all know the psalms of David. They all know this is definitely inspired scripture. And so they said they would listen to this. And Jesus is quoting Psalm 82, 6, where the psalmist says, I have said, ye are gods, 
and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall as one of the princes. So you're all gods because you're all children of the Most High. Now, Jesus then says that he is Father. He says that God is his Father. And they get mad because they said, well, you're blaspheming. You're blaspheming because you're making yourself uh, a as God. And he said, doesn't your law say the same thing? The law says you're the offspring of the Most High God. You aren't you gods? You are his sons? So then here's the point he makes. If he called them gods unto, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said I am the Son of God? In other words, here's what I'm saying. Your own law calls you gods, and you are just the recipients of God. But I've been sent into the world. I've sanct been sanctified and sent into the world. And you're saying I'm blaspheming because I said that I'm the son of God. When it says the same thing about you. See? You ought to go stone yourself. See? And so he's using, and notice he says their law. He says their law because that's what they held in high regard. And so if you will just use a little bit of uh, uh, ingenuity, a little research, you can find how to defeat the enemy. And friends, this is why individuals do not like members of the, of the Church of Christ. This is why denominations do not like members of the Church of Christ because we will put their, uh, their doctrines out to be examined. We'll use their authorities against them. You know why people don't like us quoting from creed books and catechisms? Because it exposes them. Their own writings expose them. And so we defeat the enemy very easily by just using the weapon against them. Now, I want to show you how easy it is. Friends, most of you, I'm going to say the majority of you, use uh, instru mechanical instruments of music in your worship. And you're saying, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. The Bible, doesn't, the Bible says it's okay. God's all right with it. Well, let's just see if that's the case. Do you realize that many of you are in churches started by men and those men would disagree with you? They would actually agree with the Bible on this point uh, like instrumental music. Listen to what Martin Luther said. Here's Martin Luther, the, the namesake of the Lutheran church. Here's what he says. The organ in the worship is the insignia of Baal. The Roman Catholic barred it from the Jews. Now, here you are in the Lutheran church, and you're defending, oh, we've got to have our organs, we've got to have our instruments of music, and Martin Luther says that it was the insignia of Baal. Now, what would you do with Martin Luther? If Martin Luther was here today, here you are in the Lutheran church, what are you going to do with Martin Luther? Are you going to throw him under the bus? Are you going to reject him? Are you going to deny him? The man that you, whose name you're wearing... As Lutheran, here's what he says. He says, you borrowed this from the Catholic Church. Or the Catholic Church borrowed it from the Jews, excuse me. The Catholics borrowed it from, from the Jews. It doesn't have, it's the insignia of Baal. What are you going to do with that? See, your own authority, your own uh, founder is fighting against you on this point. When all we're saying, friends, is let's just go with what the Bible says. The Bible does not authorize mechanical instruments of music in worship to God today. And you want to argue with the you want to argue with the scripture? Well, what about arguing with your own with your own with your own daddy? What about arguing with the founder of the of the uh, the Lutheran Church? See see how that works. Now, for those of you, you say, well, yeah, James, you really got the Lutherans, all right? Well, how about we take on the Presbyterians? Again, this is your writings. This is what you wrote. This is what this is your authority. And this just goes to show you how men will change their mind as time goes on. In 1842, 1842, this is from the Confession of Faith and Form of Government of the Presbyterian Church of the United States of the United States of America. So the Presbyterian USA. And this is a book of questions on, on the Confession of Faith, published by the Presbyterian Board of Publications, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 1842, page 55. Here's question number six. Is there any authority for instrumental music in the worship of God under the present dispensation? Now see, 
Here's the difference between Presbyterians in 1842 and Presbyterians in 2017. In 1842, they were concerned about authority. They were concerned about, the, is there any authority for it? Now, you won't hear that coming out of a Presbyterian's mouth today. Well, let's see if we have biblical authority for it. They're not concerned about what the Bible says. They're not concerned about getting any kind of scripture to authorize what they're doing. So I doubt you'll find any questions like this in the, Presbyter in the Presbyterian church today talking about their form of government or the confession of faith. But here's the question. Is there any authority for instrumental music in the worship of God? Under the present dispensation, that's the New Testament, which is what we're under. Here's the answer. Answer, not in the least. Do we need to read the question again? Is there any authority for instrumental music in the worship of God today? Not in the least. Only the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs was appointed by the apostles. Whoa. I wonder how many Presbyterians are going to go burn the organ now, tear up the piano. You ought, you ought, to, have, you ought to revolt. Man, the, the Presbyterians have changed. They used to be concerned about biblical authority. Now, I'm sure they don't even bat an eye about what, the, what goes on. But here it is. Not the least bit of authority. Only the singing of Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs uh, was appointed by the apostles. Not a syllable is said in the New Testament in favor of instrumental music, nor was it ever introduced into the church until after the 8th century. Can you imagine that? Not a syllable? You would think this is coming from a gospel preacher. You would think that this question was answered by a gospel preacher and, uh, and who is, who is uh, um, uh, uh, telling people about the, the one church. You would think that this is uh, an answer by uh, somebody on the word of the Lord or what does the Bible say today, right? You wouldn't know who's answering this. You know it's not a Presbyterian. Presbyterian won't tell you this. Not a syllable in the New Testament. And y'all will say, well, all y'all do, y'all just, you know, y'all nitpick and pick and choose verses you want to. Take it up with your own authorities. I'm just, I'm just quoting your own authorities. I'm quoting your own confession. See how that goes? I, I, I don't have to use the Bible sometimes. I'll just take the we your own weapon away from you and spank you with it. Not a syllable. Now what are you going to do? See, I'm actually standing with, with your forefathers in the Presbyterian church on this point because they're right. Not a syllable. Yet what are you going to do, friends? Are you going to run? Are you going to fight it? You're going to be fighting all your ancestors. Fight all your ancestors. The, the answer actually goes on and says this. It says, After the Catholics had corrupted the simplicity of the gospel by their carnal inventions. Whew! That's some bold talk for the Presbyterians now, right? You wouldn't, I don't think you'd hear a Presbyterian talking that way. Catholics corrupted the gospel? Catholics have carnal inventions? Well, that's kind of judgmental, isn't it? It was not allowed in the synagogues, the parish churches of the Jews, but was confined to the temple service and was abolished with the rights of that dispensation. I believe I just heard them say that it ended when the New Testament came into existence, when the New Testament came into authority. It ended with the Old Testament. When have you heard a denomination say there's no longer authority for mechanical instruments of music in worship because it ended or it was abolished with the rites of the Old Testament. See, friends, I, you don't argue with me. You're going to be arguing with, with, your own, uh, with your own brethren. See how it is? We're just taking, taking their weapons and using it against them. And again, that's from the, uh, the question on the confession of faith and former government of the Presbyterian Church in the, U in the USA. 1842. Here's one more. What about the Methodists? We've, got, we've had the, the Lutherans. We talked about the Presbyterians. Now we're going we're gonna to get down here to the, to the Methodists. Here's John Wesley. John Wesley said, I have no objection to instruments of music in our worship, provided they are neither seen nor heard. Now what's the point of having it if you can't see it and can't hear it? Now that's John Wesley. That's the founder of the Methodist Church saying this who says, 
No objection to instruments of music as long as you don't listen to them. Can't hear them, can't see them. Friends, did you ever stop and think that maybe now's the time to open up the Bible and say, you know what? These guys might have been on to something. They were, they, they, were, they were speaking a little bit of truth here. They missed a whole lot more. But on this point, they've got it right. Now, are you going to argue with John Wesley? You'll cite him for other things. Why don't you cite him on this? You'll quote him on, on other things. You'll quote him on born in sin, or you'll quote him on uh, uh, women preachers, I guess, or something, but will you, will you quote him on instrumental music? Why not? He's one of your own authorities. He's one of your own authorities. Now, let's get one more on, on, on John Wesley. Let's move on about denominations. Now, friends, did you ever stop to think that you would hear a founder of a denomination actually condemn the very denomination he's in? But that's what he does. That's what he does. Here's what John Wesley said. This is from his writings, Works, uh, Volume 9, page 433, uh, Volume 11, 433. Beware of schism and of making a rent in the church of Christ. That inward disunion, the members ceasing to have a reciprocal love one for another, is the very root of all contention and every outward separation. Beware of everything tending thereto. Beware of a dividing spirit. Shun whatever has the least aspect that way. Therefore I say, therefore say not, I am a Paul or Apollos, the very thing which occasioned the schism at Corinth. Friends, John Wesley thought he was a part of the Church of Christ. He thought he was a member of the Church of Christ, but he wasn't. What he was actually doing was actually founding a religion that was actually causing division. But he spoke the truth on this. It's like Paul saying, one of your own poets said, your own founder said it. There shouldn't be any divisions in the body of Christ, yet Methodism, Methodism, is foreign to the Bible. The Methodist Church is not in the Bible. The majority of the teachers is not in the Bible. But yet, John Wesley was right. There shouldn't be any divisions. Shouldn't be any schisms. Shouldn't be any, any uh, uh, dividing spirits. We ought to be speaking, the, minding the same thing, speaking the same thing, being the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Well, friends, you don't have to get, don't get mad at me. You need to get mad at John Wesley. He's the one saying it. See, all I'm doing is I'm just using, I'm just using your own writers, your own authors against you. So you can't say, well, all y'all do is divide. John Wesley said the same thing. He said there shouldn't be any differences, no divisions. If I say that, if I say that, everybody says, oh, you're causing trouble, stirring up trouble. John Wesley says it, and everybody praises him. So just pretend John Wesley is, is standing here saying this. Friends, if you're in the, in the Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian church, you're all divided. You're not in the, in the church that you read about in the Bible. I didn't, I didn't say it. Take it up with John Wesley, see? He's, he's in line with the truth on this. See? So when you talk about people changing the Bible and going off on their own, all you have to do is show from their own writings. Listen, I know y'all have seen this plenty of times, but here's the Baptist manual. The Baptist manual that is admitting being different from the early church. Now this is, this is its own writings. This is, this is out of your own mouth, you might say. One of your own poets is saying this. Right? Here's what it says. It is most likely, this is from the, the uh, Baptist Hiscox Manual, it is most likely that in the apostolic age when there was but one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and no convert by that very act constituted him a member of the church and at once endowed him with all the rights and privileges of full membership. In that sense, baptism was the door into the church. Now it is different. Who changed it? They're admitting they changed it. 
they're admitting that they are different from what it used to be in the, in the New Testament. So friends, don't get mad when I say the Baptist church is not the same as the New Testament church. And don't take my word for it. Listen, your own manual say that. Now you know what they do? When they rewrite their manuals year after year, they modify and change it, water it down, but this is what they used to say. It's like the Presbyterians. I'm sure it's changed, but that's what it used to say. And so, friends, you see how easy it is to show that, uh, take, take the enemy's weapons, take your own writings, and I'm just showing you that even your own writings will condemn what you're doing. So, it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. Now, if you don't believe me, will you believe your own, own writings? See that? If you don't believe me, will you believe what your own uh authority say. Now, here's how easy it is. Let's look at one more. Here's how easy it is. Seventh-day Adventist. You kill them with their own writings and their own speech. And friends, that's why we do that. That's why we, we quote these, these individuals. That's why we quote Jerry Falwell and Billy Graham and play videos of them. You know why? It's because it's showing how, how uh, uh, confusing they are. Showing how contradictory they are. Notice what this is Mr. Ron Rogers. Listen to what he said. Talking about the authority of Ellen G. White. This uh, uh, room or hall. Uh, Mr. Ophir was there. Uh, later, when I watched his television program, he said on that television program, he mentioned something about Ellen White. And uh, he had on the screen from the book, uh, Early Writings, a statement that she had made about a vision that she had. And he made the statement that Seventh-day Adventists get their authority from Ellen White. Anybody who knows anything about the Seventh-day Adventist Church knows that that is not true. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has not taken one doctrine upon which it, it stands from Ellen White. The Seventh-day Adventist Church bases its doctrines on the Bible and the Bible alone. Now, friends, he's pretty adamant there. He is very insistent and persistent that they don't get any of their doctrine from Ellen White. Now, friends, I have to wonder something. I'm going to question something. Either Mr. Rogers is not telling us the truth and trying to mislead us, or he doesn't know the very religion that he's in. He doesn't know the very doctrines that they teach. Now, I want you to consider... This quote from the Seventh-day Adventists. One of the gifts of the, of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church and was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Now notice, as the Lord's messenger, her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. Now friends, that doesn't get any plainer than that. And so if uh, you find any other information contrary to that in books in the bookstore or somebody saying something, I can assure you, you check with the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist in, in Maryland at the General Conference uh, office, and you will find that what I've just told you is the fact. He said... You want to work the Lord? Hi, James. Uh, I, I noticed most people that you see out in society that... They just go to the biggest, nicest church they can find for the status. They don't care what's in, inside or whatever. They just go to make themselves think, well, somebody might see me here and I, I'm a, I stand out better. And then they, they leave with a suit on, and later on you st still see them with a Sunday best on in a supermarket buying beer. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, a, it's just a social club. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate your program. All right. Check with the Seventh-day Adventist headquarters, the General Conference in Maryland, and you'll get the facts. We looked at what they said about Ellen G. White, and this is what we found. We found the quote we just read, that they use Ellen G. White's writings as an authoritative, a continuing and authoritative source of truth, and that comes right from the Seventh-day Adventist manual, chapter 3, section 17, under the heading, the gift of prophecy, page 14 and 15, and there it is. 
sanctioned by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists in Maryland, right where he said go. Friends, I went right where he said to go, and I found exactly opposite of what he said they believed. All right, now see how easy that is, friend? Here he's saying, you do, I, I can assure you we don't believe this, and yet that's what they believe. That's what they say they believed. It just it ran, put a javelin right through him. I mean, he just killed him, graveyard dead. His doctrine, he doesn't even know what he believes. Or he's trying to convince you of something different. But when you do a little, just do a little digging, that just took him at his word. And what do you have? You actually have them saying Ellen G. White is their authority. So when, some, when they say, no, we don't use Ellen G. White's writing as authority, they do. Now, even after they change it, you can still, you can still beat their doctrine up with it. Listen, this is, this is after they've modified their, their creed books and their writing, their authorities. Here is what it says now under the heading Gift of Prophecy from their, uh, uh, their, their writings. It says, the scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church, and we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Well, if Ellen G. White was a prophet, a prophetess, wouldn't you listen to what she says? Wouldn't you listen to what she wrote? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, he said, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord. So, Ellen G. White, if she was speaking by prophecy, then surely we're going to say, hey, if she was inspired, we need to listen to her. All right? Let's, go, let's continue. It says, her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction for the church. Now, doesn't that sound a awful lot like a verse that we know from the Bible? 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then in Romans 15, verse 4, that the things written aforetime time written for our learning, that we through comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And yet Ellen G. White's writings, they say, provide prophetic authority, comfort, uh, guidance, instruction, and correction for the church. Well, there's no two ways around that, friends. They're using Ellen G. White's writings as authority. So, all I have to do is when a guy says, well, we don't use Ellen G. White's writing for authority, well, your own writings say it. Your own prophets say it. See how easy it is? Take their weapon away from them and beat them over the head with it. Now, if they won't if they won't agree to this, then they're denying their, their own prophetess. Now, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a way, friends, that you can all use. I, you know, I told you that disarming an attacker is, is very easy. You just learn a few moves and you can disarm them. Now, watch this. Some of you know that one of the uh, constant, uh, I'll say, bothers... You got these people coming knocking on the doors. So they're wearing white shirts and black tie, and got a little elder sign on their on their shirt. Well, here's how you can disarm them. Here's how you can disarm them. Thank you, From their own writings, the Latter Day Saints they will run. They will run like a scalded rabbit if you will hold them to the fire with their own weapon. Listen to what it says. This is from Doctrine and Covenants, chapter seventy-one, verse seven. It says, Wherefore, confound your enemies, call upon them to meet you both in public and in private, and inasmuch as ye are faithful, their shame shall be made manifest. Now listen again to what it says. Doctrine and Covenants is telling Mormons, Latter-day Saints, to confound their enemies and call upon them to meet in public and in private. You know what? There's, there's not a Mormon that will come on in public or private. Now, now I'll have a debate. Standing invitation. They won't do it. You know why? Because they don't believe their own writings. But they, they don't know that you know this. So just write it down. DNC 71 verse 7. And then notice what it says. 
And in so much as ye are faithful, their shame shall be made manifest. Well, if they can't shame their enemies, it must be because they're not faithful. See, you can, you can use their weapon against them. You can use their weapon against them and show that they don't even believe what they teach. They don't practice what they, what they teach. Just use it against them. And friends, we, we've done this countless of times showing you that Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, you know, it's easy to defeat these people. Just know a few verses, know a few of their writings, be familiar with their book, take their weapon and use it against them. Now, when they come knocking on the door, just say, oh, do you have a copy of the Doctrine and Covenants with you? And when they say yes, or if they say yes, I don't know if they carry one or not. I know they carry the Book of Mormon. But they say, well, read Doctrine and Covenants 71, verse 7. And when they read that, say, now, I know there's some folks in this area that have a standing invitation for, for a public or private debate. Now, are you going to do this? Will you do it? And you just give them my number. Just give them a number, you know. Send them over, send them over to uh, uh, 250 the Boulevard, 823 Starting Avenue, 120 American Legion, or call uh, one of us and say, hey, these folks said that they're going to do DNC 717. They won't do it, friends. You put them on the run. It's just that easy. See, take the weapon and use it against them. Now, friends, I want to show you one more. Do you know, friends, that denominations want to be like the Church of Christ? I'm not talking about the Church of Christ as they think. I'm talking about the Church of Christ like we are. Especially the Baptist. I want to talk to you for a minute. You may have seen this. You may have read this. You may have seen this quote before. But I want you to listen to what one of your own said. I want you to listen to what one of your own said about growing, about being zealous, about being on fire. This is from William Dahoney. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's from uh, Wayne Dahoney, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, in his book, Set the Church on Fire. This is what he says about the Church of Christ. He says the Church of Christ are anti-ecumenical, in their relationship, uh, in their relationships. That is, they don't say, well, we're all one big family. Let's all go along to get along. They don't have unity movements and, and things like that. Now, that's what he says about us. And he's right. He's right. For the most part, he's right. He says, they're conservative in their theology, autonomous and democratic in their congregation practice without any semblance of a denominational superstructure. Now, Today, people say, well, well James, you're you just part of a denomination. No, I'm not part of a denomination. And Mr. Wayne Dahoney, former president of the Baptist Church, actually uh, agrees with that point. Church of Christ don't have any semblance of denominational superstructure. Then he says, they have a rigid uh, biblical, I have to back up here. They have a rigid biblical uh, moral and ethical demands. They might know that they have a rigid biblical theology and a strong emphasis in Bible teaching and uh, make rigid and moral and ethical demands on their members in such matters as social drinking. You know what he's saying about us? He's saying we try to keep our lives pure. Yeah, we don't, we don't go to church and then on, on Sunday afternoon go out to the beer store. Don't have beer in the fridge, right? Not out here smoking. Don't have a cigarette butt disposal right outside the door of the church building so you can get your last draw before you go in and blow smoke in the auditorium. No, nope, none of that. See, that's what he says about us. And then he says, uh, so no social drinking. Then he says, they are not social action oriented. We're not doing out here doing a million man march. 
right? We're not out here boycotting and protesting in the street, taking a knee. What we're going to do is change your hearts and minds by the Word. He says, so they're not here social action oriented. They have a messianic complex of being the true people of God and the true church. Now, friends, what he's saying is, he's actually uh, praising the fact that we believe that we are the true people of God and that we are God's people. He's, 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 uh, he's, he's, he's uplifting that point. And he says all these factors combine to give them a high motivation, unquenchable zeal, and an inescapable compulsion to win the world to an acceptance of their conviction and belief, and they are growing rapidly. That was back in the 70s when he said that. And he said this is what the Baptist church ought to be like. Here's my point, friends. The Baptists want to be like the church of Christ. They, you want to be like us. You want to be like us. And what I've done is I've shown you one of your own that says you need to be like us. Does that carry any weight with you? See, all I'm doing is using, the, using your own weapon against you. I'm using your own authority. Here is the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and he says, Baptist, we need to be like the Church of Christ. We need to have this complex that we are the only people of God and that we need to get out and have a compulsion to, to teach what we believe. But you know what? Most of you don't do that. Y'all want to say when we, go, we come talk to you, no, we're not going to argue the Scripture. We're not going to talk to you. You're welcome to come as long as you don't say anything. Really? He says if you want to grow, you need to be like the Church of Christ. Don't take it up with me. Take it up with him. I'm just telling you what he says. Friends, this is my point. This is my point. It's easy to show people the contradictions that they're in by using their own weapon. Now, you know what, friends? Let me come down what I've got just a few minutes left. Let me make this point. The greatest thing that Jesus did was take the enemy's weapon away and use it on him. And that's why we do the same thing. We take what you write, what you say, what your preachers say, use it against them. Why? Because we want to defeat the enemy. We want to, compete, we want to defeat the doctrine. Because we want you to be saved. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He took the enemy's weapon and he defeated the enemy with it. He said, what are you talking about, James? Well, listen. Let's just go to Genesis Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Listen to what God says to the, to the serpent, to the devil. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The seed of woman was going to crush Satan. You know how Jesus did that? Here's how Jesus did that. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see that? He destroyed him that had the power of death through death. How did he do that? He died. He died and then rose again, destroying the power of death. See that? Notice. Here's what we're talking about. See, the devil uses death and he wants you to believe that once, once you die, it's all over. There's, there's nothing else. He thought if I could just kill, if I could kill the Messiah, <clears throat> then that would be it. But I want you to notice this. The power of God, the power of God is the ability to raise them from the dead. Now listen to this. In Hebrews 11 verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, 
And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a, in a figure. You see, Christ died. He said, I laid down my life. No, no man takes it from me. I lay it down and I take it up again. This is the promise I received from my father. You know why? Because he was going to take the devil's weapon, death, and he was going to kill him with it, going to beat him with it. And that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25. 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Talking about Christ. He's going to reign till all enemies are under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. <coughs> uh, except, except God. God's the only exception there. But he, look, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. How, how was he going to defeat death? He was going to die and then raise again, come up out of the grave and be raised again. That's why Paul said, back up in chapter uh, 15, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12, he said, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching in vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, uh, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and ye are yet in your sins. Christ died so that we can have forgiveness of sins. If Christ died and stayed in the grave, there would be no forgiveness, no hope for us. What's the point if he isn't raised? And so the way God says death is going to be defeated is by Christ dying and having power over death. Having the power over death. And that's exactly what he did. He showed that he had the power over death by raising him from the dead. Romans 1 and verse, verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead is what defeated Satan and what gives us hope if we're obedient to God. Now friends, this is why this is so important. Because this is how you can defeat the devil. This is how you can defeat the enemy. Take his own weapon, death, and use it against him. You say, well, James, how can I do that? Christ has already done that. Well, look with me here. Look with me. In Romans, Romans chapter 6, <clears throat> notice what Paul says, starting in verse 3. He says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Why do we need to be baptized into his death? Well, that's how he defeated Satan. He died and rose again. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism uh, into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, if you're saying, well, baptism doesn't have anything to do with my salvation. Really? If baptism doesn't have anything to do with your salvation, then Christ's death must not have anything to do with your salvation. You die with Christ in baptism. You're buried with Christ in baptism. And when you come up out of the water from being buried with Christ, guess what? You're raised with him in baptism. The same power that raised up Christ from the grave is the same power that resurrects you to a new life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, 
that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. How did you die? Buried. How, did you, how were you alive again? Raised from the watery grave. That's why now I have the hope of eternal life. Never to die again. Why? Because I've been buried with Christ, died with Christ, buried with Christ, and raised with Christ. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. And my friends, because of this, I have hope that when I die, I'm going to be raised again. Because the same power that raised me to walk in a new life by being baptized with Christ, being buried with Christ in baptism, dying with him in baptism, and being raised again in baptism, from baptism, is what gives me that same hope that I will overcome death. That's, and that's exactly what, what Paul is saying. That's why you defeat death, or that's how you can defeat death. Notice, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. He said, uh, excuse me, verse, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 53, this corruptible must put on incorruptible. This body's going to change. This mortal shall put on immortality. So, then this corruptible have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? I don't have to worry about dying. I don't have to worry about dying because I have been raised with Christ. Now see how, how wonderful that is? See how special that is? That is the power of God to take the devil's uh, weapon and use it against him. The devil thought, if I just kill the Christ, then I'm going to win. If I kill the Christ, I'll be victorious. No. You go ahead and kill him. You go ahead and kill him. And I'm going to raise him up again. And that's going to destroy death. Death has no more victory. But friends, you only get that victory if you die with Christ in baptism, and here you are fighting against it. Here you are saying, oh no, baptism doesn't have anything to do with my salvation. Now what the Bible says, the Bible says that has everything to do with your salvation. It's part of God's plan. That's where you die with Christ, you're buried with Christ, and you're raised with Christ. It is in baptism where God operates and takes away your sin. That's how you use the devil's weapon against him. De die so that you can defeat death. Friends, I am out of time. I'm out of time, but I want to remind you of my content information, 276-340-2653. You can call me, email me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com, and remember, a word from the Lord on the radio, Sunday afternoons at 5 p.m. It's a live call-in. You can download the app, Rockingham County uh, Radio. It's rcr24.com. Really easy to remember. Download the app onto your phone, your smartphone, your tablet, or whatever, and you listen to it as you drive. If you can't uh, pick up the signal on 1490, uh, AM or 1420 AM, that's WLOE and WMYN. If you can't pick those up locally, listen to it on your phone. If you can't listen to it on your phone, go get on your computer, uh, bring it up, just on the computer, click on YouTube, uh, go to uh, uh, James Oldfield, the Word from the Lord, you can find it there. Uh, all kinds of ways that you can listen to the, to the gospel, all kinds of ways you can get a word from the Lord. Thanks for watching. Till next week, God bless and have a good night.